Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and high honor to introduce Eric Johnson. He is best known to us as former governor of New Mexico, where he served from 1995 through 2003. During his first term, he cut the 10% annual growth in the budget by vetoing half of the bills in his first six months. During his two-term tenure, he adhered to a strict anti-tax, anti-bureaucracy program and set state and national records for exercising his veto hours. A total of more than the 49 other governors combined. 750 vetoes over two terms. Term limited, Gary retired from politics at the end of the second term. However, the rumors are 2012 presidential candidate. Our America Initiative, a 501c4 political advocacy organization. And on a more personal note to me, is an avid rock climber and made the ascent of Everest in 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Johnson. I um, wanted you to know that. Uh, First and foremost, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I started a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque in 1974, uh, me. Uh, and in 1994, I uh, actually had a thousand employees. Wow. Like mechanical, <laughs> and yeah, and credit, credit to all those thousand employees, uh, showing up on time, doing what you said you'd do for people, doing a little bit more than what you said you'd do for people. Um, American dream. Um, I view my venture into politics as um, entrepreneurial. Uh, I had never been involved in politics uh, prior to running for governor of New Mexico. I went and I introduced myself to the Republican Party a couple of weeks before I announced. And what they said was, wow, we like you, we like what you've got to say, but you just need to know that you'll never get elected. Uh -huh. It's not possible to come from completely outside of politics and get elected governor in a state that's 2-1 Democrat. Well, I got elected. And how did that happen? Uh, I'd like to think it was based on what I had to say, which was that I was going to bring a common sense business approach to state government, that it was going to be about best product, best service, lowest price, um, that I was going to run state government like a business. Issues first, politics last. I got elected. When I got elected, I found myself saying no a lot, of, a lot of times. Um, I ended up vetoing 750 bills while I was governor of New Mexico. I had, <laughs> I had thousands of line item vetoes. I took line item veto to a whole new art form. <laughs> and only two of the vetoes were overridden. So it ended up making a huge difference in New Mexico to the tune of billions of dollars worth of spending. I mean, I vetoed, I vetoed all taxes. There wasn't one single tax that went up over an eight-year period in New Mexico. So I was able to veto that stuff. I didn't add one penny of entitlement liability to taxpayers in New Mexico because I saw the state pension system as a Ponzi scheme and tried to change that through legislation. Oh, but that didn't happen. I vetoed all sorts of regulation that, in my opinion, just had unintended consequence, and that would have been adverse to business. Uh, so, uh, again, it, it really made a huge, huge difference in the state of New Mexico. Of all those bills that I vetoed, um, the legislature was made up a third of Republicans. A third of the bills that I vetoed were Republican bills. Because Republicans actually grew government just like Democrats, only they did it in a way that grew government that somehow was going to come back around and ultimately shrink government. I never got that formula. I just, I just vetoed the, the legislation. And about a hundred of the bills that I vetoed were bills where the vote in the legislature was 117 to zero. And I vetoed the legislation. And it, inevitably it had to do with do we really need to spend money? Is spending this money going to really make a difference in any New Mexican's life? And stood up and took on that debate, took on that discussion. 
I have to tell you, in a state that's two to one Democrat, no just doesn't fly. Reasons for no flies. And the fact that I got re-elected, I just think speaks volumes to the fact that people really do appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars. I think I'm living through it. I just want you to know, I had a Mr. Smith goes to Washington experience as governor of New Mexico. I've come to recognize that there are a lot of Mr. Smiths that go to Washington, uh, but I was one of them. Um, as governor of New Mexico, I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice. I really believe in free markets. I really believe that bringing educational entrepreneurs into our educational system, K-12, through would dramatically improve education. Educational entrepreneurs delivering better products, better services, at lower prices. So for six straight years in New Mexico, I proposed that every single student in the state of New Mexico get a school voucher that would have brought about that competition. Now, the legislature never passed that legislation, but I have to tell you, uh, there was discussion, there was conversation, there was debate over this all the time while I was governor. And citizens of New Mexico, when I started this debate, went from 65% opposed to school vouchers to supporting school vouchers by 52% when I left office. So you really, you really can make a difference. Uh, when I started out my second term as governor, um, you know, I, I made this promise that um, I was going to put the issues that should be on the front burner on the front burner regardless of the political consequences. What are we spending and what are we getting for the money that we're spending? So in that context, starting my second term, uh, I really wanted to take a hard look at the war on drugs, and I wanted to include legalization as a potential alternative. Now, I came at this, this from the standpoint that half of what we spend on law enforcement, the courts, and the prisons is drug-related, about $70 billion a year. And what are we getting for our $70 billion a year? Nothing. Well, we're arresting 1.8 million people a year in this country, which I always point out is the population of New Mexico that gets arrested in this country every single year. And we now have 2.3 million people behind bars in this country. We have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. And the majority of those individuals behind bars are there because they've sold drugs. That's the majority of those behind bars. So in looking at the issue, and I would ask you to do the same, I would ask you to look at the issue if you haven't already, uh, in a very short amount of time, I came to the conclusion that 90% of the drug problem is prohibition related, uh, not use related, and that's not to discount the problems with use and abuse, uh, but that ought to be the focus. So in 1999, I, uh, I came out in support of legalizing marijuana. And when I say legalizing marijuana, it's never going to be legal to smoke pot, become impaired, get behind the wheel of a car, or do harm to others. It's never going to be legal for kids to smoke pot or to buy pot. And under which scenario would it be more likely that kids would be able to buy pot? In a scenario where it would be a controlled environment, where you'd have to produce a license to buy the marijuana, or a situation where it's virtually available anywhere on the street, and if there is a gateway aspect to marijuana, it's the fact that the person that sells marijuana also sells harder drugs. I think you can make the case that it might be less available. Uh, and then when it comes to all the other drugs, uh, I advocate harm reduction strategies, which I think are the things we really care about, uh, reducing death, disease, crime, corruption. In a nutshell, it's looking at the drug problem first as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. Uh, I left office January 1 of 2003. Uh, I was term limited. Uh, I am a firm believer in term limits. I think as a result of term limits, uh, politicians do good things for you and I, and I include me in that category, as opposed to whatever it takes uh, to get reelected. So I got out of office January 1, 2003. I didn't want to have a say in what was happening in national politics. I didn't want to have a say in what was happening in state politics because I had my shot, and I really thought I made the most out of that shot. But about 18 months ago, I just find myself outraged over the fact that this country is bankrupt. That 43 cents out of every dollar that we're spending is borrowed, 
And I think the greatest threat to our national security, I think the greatest threat to our well-being, to our way of life, is the fact that we continue to spend more money every single year than what we take in. And we've got to fix this. So I advocate that we balance the budget tomorrow. There is no more... There is no more kicking the can down the road anymore. It's here, and it's now. And that means Medicaid, and that means Medicare. And I think Medicaid and Medicare need to be capitated from the federal government uh, to, to block grant the states and let the states take over health care when it comes to the poor and to the elderly. And for that matter, that extends all the way across the board. And of course, constitutionally, that's what we've set up in this country, is the notion of 50 laboratories of innovation that are out in this notion of best practices that would get emulated by other states, failures avoided. The notion that Washington knows best on these issues is just absolutely crazy. So Medicaid and Medicare, capitated to the states, give it back to the states. When it comes to Social Security, Social Security is very remediable uh, in, in, in comparison to Medicare. I mean, Medicare is going to virtually encompass all government spending here in a very short amount of time unless it's actually reined in. Social Security, though, I think it's a combination of raising the retirement age, a cut in benefit, and it's to get over a bubble with the baby boomers now becoming eligible uh, for uh, retirement. But it is a Ponzi scheme. It's dependent on those that haven't uh, collected any benefit to continue to pay into the system. And I do believe that it's remediable. And then defense. Um, can we continue in this country to spend more money on defense, on military spending, than all the other countries in the world combined? No! When, no! when we're only 5% of the world's population? I just don't think that we can continue to nation build when we have our own nation to build. I would have been a <laughs>